I have great relationship with God. I have great relationship with uh, the evangelical. Donald Trump is a Christian. He never hid his belief in God. He mentioned him anytime and anywhere and showed respect for him. In his public speeches, Trump also emphasized the presence of God and expressed that he relied on him a lot. He is his spiritual strength. Trump is also one of the rare politicians who publicly declares his faith and defends it. What Trump has shown shows that he is truly a religious person. Donald Trump says he can completely rely on Jesus and that the Christian religion is so important. Even Trump once said, Jesus Christ forever changed the world. The U.S. needs a savior and it's not me. And recently the messages Trump gave about his faith will certainly shock Christians. Trump is not a savior, but God. As I said, Trump really believes in God and is not afraid to publicly reveal him. He is a pious Christian. Former U.S. President Donald Trump has spoken of the importance of Jesus Christ to the American people as part of a Christmas. The 45th president addressed the 4,000-strong crowd at First Baptist Church, Dallas, in 2021. Speaking as part of the church's Christmas worship service, Trump said, More than 2,000 years ago, an angel of the Lord appeared to humble shepherds and proclaimed the reason for our Christmas joy. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Former President Donald Trump delivered an address about contentious policies, and Jesus warning that America is in trouble, but can find hope in the Lord. We're in trouble. I think our nation's in great trouble, Trump said during his approximately 10-minute address. I don't think we've ever had a time like this with what happened in Afghanistan, the way that was done so badly. The former president went on to mention inflation, the border crisis, and other controversial issues, but at one point pivoted to discuss the Christmas story. Our country needs a savior right now, and our country has a savior, and that's not me. That's somebody much higher up than me. Much higher up, Trump said. The life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ forever changed the world. He said it is impossible to think of the history and life of America without the influence of his example and of his teachings. From there, he cited landmark moments in U.S. history that tie in with this faith perspective. Our miraculous founding, overcoming civil war, abolishing slavery, defeating communism and fascism, reaching boundless heights of science and discovery, Trump said. The United States ultimately becoming a truly great nation, and we're going to keep it that way. We're going to keep it that way. We're not going to let it go. Trump added that none of America's accomplishments would have been possible without Jesus Christ and his followers and his church. Following his speech, Trump was met with a standing ovation by Christians, while lead pastor Robert Jeffress referred to Trump as one of his closest friends and a great friend to Christians everywhere, as he praised the former president for his pro-life, pro-religious liberty, and pro-Israel political stances. Former President Trump also joked that only Jesus Christ could secure enough support from House Republicans to win the speakership. The ex-president's joke comes as the vacancy for speaker hits three weeks and nine GOP candidates have now tossed their names into the mix. At that moment, Trump stressed the difficulty of the four-vote threshold. The maximum number of House Republicans candidates can afford to lose in a floor vote while still winning the speaker's gavel. That four threshold is very tough. It's a very tough thing, no matter who it is, Trump said. There's only one person that can do it all the way. Do you know who that is? Jesus Christ. If Jesus came down and said, I want to be speaker, he would do it. Other than that, I haven't seen anybody that can guarantee it, Trump continued. Trump protects Christians. He also pledged to support Christians in the Middle East being persecuted by Islamic extremists like IS. I'm going to treat my religion, which is Christian, with great respect and care, he promised. It's a very dangerous thing that's happening. There's people in this country that are Jewish and no longer love Israel. Trump recently told journalist Barack Ravid, I'll tell you, 
the evangelical Christians love Israel more than the Jews in this country. Continued, It used to be that Israel had absolute power over Congress, and today I think it's the exact opposite. And I think Obama and Biden did that. And yet in the election, they still get a lot of votes from the Jewish people. Which tells you that the Jewish people, and I've said this for a long time, the Jewish people in the United States either don't like Israel or don't care about Israel. Trump was also under fire for saying there are Jewish people who run the New York Times critiquing the Sulzberger family, the family that has published the newspaper for over 100 years, for its stance on Israel. I mean, you look at the New York Times. The New York Times hates Israel. Hates them, he said. And they're Jewish people that run the New York Times. I mean the Sulzberger family. Trump has indeed been very supportive of Israel, even making the controversial decision in 2017 to move the country's capital from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. This move had been promised by previous presidents who never made the decision to honor their pledge. President Trump is committed to protecting religious freedom in the United States and around the world. He said, Each of us has the right to follow the dictates of our conscience and the demands of our religious conviction. Throughout his term, Trump has taken many practical actions to protect Christians. Advancing Religious Freedom Around the World Trump was putting religious freedom on center stage at the United Nations. President Trump was hosting the Global Call to Protect Religious Freedom event, calling on the international community and business leaders to work to protect religious freedom. He was calling on all nations to act to bring an end to religious persecution and stop crimes against people of faith. The State Department has hosted two religious freedom ministerials, during which more than 100 governments and religious leaders committed to fight religious persecution. The administration is spearheading the International Religious Freedom Alliance, an alliance of nations dedicated to confronting religious persecution around the world. The administration has taken steps to protect victims of all faiths from religious violence. The United States has provided humanitarian aid to help Christians and Yazidis who suffered at the hands of ISIS and to help Rohingya Muslim refugees fleeing persecution. Safeguarding Religious Freedom at Home Trump has made it a priority to support every American's fundamental right to religious freedom enshrined in the Bill of Rights. In 2017, Trump signed an executive order to advance religious freedom, restoring the ideals that have undergirded our nation since its founding. He took action to ensure Americans and organizations are not forced to violate their religious or moral beliefs by complying with Obamacare's contraceptive mandate. The Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, established a new Conscience and Religious Freedom Division to help direct the agency's efforts to protect religious freedom. HHS took action to protect the right of healthcare entities to act according to their conscience. The administration has unequivocally stood for religious freedom in the courts. Combating a global crisis. The Trump administration's efforts to advance religious freedom are vital to combating rising levels of violence around the globe. The Trump administration was deeply concerned for the more than one million Uyghurs interned in Chinese internment camps. Christians are the most persecuted religious group in the world. Jews, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, Sikhs, Baha'is, humanists, and non-believers alike. Almost every group has been increasingly persecuted over the past decade. Donald Trump has stated his strong support for the nation of Israel. Trump claims that he will come to Israel's defense should it be attacked. Interestingly, Trump has described negotiating peace between Israel and the Palestinians as the ultimate deal. It is possible that some form of agreement between Israel and the Palestinians will be part of the Ntima's seven-year peace covenant. Let's ask, is there any antichrist who would openly defend and praise God like that? From the time he ran for office until he was elected, and even after his term ended, Trump always praised God, and always publicly thanks him every time he achieves something. So, is Donald Trump the Antichrist? 
While Trump does possess some traits that are similar to the Bible's description of the Antichrist, the same could be said of many world leaders. Though, the answer to the question has to be, wait and see. The Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, will be revealed when the rebellion occurs. It will be abundantly clear who he is when the time comes. Rather than speculating about various scenarios and demonizing people with whom we disagree, our responsibility is to be wise and discerning based on what the Bible says about the Antichrist. Of course, in many respects, I admit that I am not qualified to draw conclusions on this sensitive issue. I only give information that I know and personally evaluate. As for your opinion, consider it yourself. Trump believes in God, but hasn't sought forgiveness. Donald Trump talked about his Christian faith, but said he's never sought forgiveness for his sins. Asked Trump whether he has ever asked God for forgiveness for his actions. I am not sure I have. I just go on and try to do a better job from there. I don't think so, he said. I think if I do something wrong, I think I just try and make it right. I don't bring God into that picture. I don't. Trump said that while he hasn't asked God for forgiveness, he does participate in Holy Communion. When I drink my little wine, which is about the only wine I drink, and have my little cracker, I guess that is a form of asking for forgiveness. And I do that as often as possible because I feel cleansed, he said. I think in terms of, let's go on and let's make it right. When received the question, you have said you never felt the need to ask for God's forgiveness, and yet repentance for one's sins is a precondition to salvation. Trump replied, I will be asking for forgiveness, but hopefully I won't have to be asking for much forgiveness. When asked who he says Jesus is, he replied, Jesus to me is somebody I can think about for security and confidence, somebody I can revere in terms of bravery and in terms of courage, and because I consider the Christian religion so important, somebody I can totally rely on in my own mind. Do Christians think Trump is Jesus? One of the big storylines in the 2024 Republican presidential nomination contest is the competition for support from politically active conservative white evangelicals, whose overwhelming support helped put Donald Trump in the White House. The battle is particularly acute in Iowa, where they make up close to two-thirds of the Republicans who will make someone the 2024 frontrunner. Trump actually lost Iowa evangelicals and the Iowa caucuses to Ted Cruz in 2016, but won an astonishing 81% of self-identified white evangelicals nationally in the 2016 general election and an only slightly less overwhelming 76% in 2020. So, some of his 2024 rivals are praying for him to lose traction in born-again pews and pulpits. These rivals have two potential points of leverage in seeking evangelical defections from Trump. First, the fury he provoked among some Christian right leaders when he cited extremism on the abortion issue as a big factor in his party's underwhelming 2022 midterm results. And second, the long-standing complaint that the heathenish 45th president is not exactly a believer himself or even religiously literate. His former vice president, Mike Pence, has been implicitly banging both drums. He is famously a devout evangelical with long-standing involvement in Christian right political causes. And he's also quickly signed onto the anti-abortion movement's 2024 litmus test of support for a national abortion ban. But the connection between Trump and conservative evangelicals may be stronger than can be measured by such tangible metrics as shared theological beliefs or even fidelity to Christian right political crusades. On the latter front, Trump can boast a record of keeping his promises to conservative Christians that no future pledges of conservative cultural activism can ever match. Why should we have faith in good or Jesus? Donald Trump believes in God unconditionally, and he let God be involved in every aspect of his life. He put his faith in God and always prayed to him. We Christians should do the same. Let God be involved in every aspect of our lives. How do we know there is a God? The truthful answer is that we cannot know for certain. 
we cannot prove the existence of God, but there are many reasons why belief in God is reasonable. The first is that nothing science has discovered explains the existence of the universe. Yet the universe has a beauty and an order that suggest a rational mind lies behind it all. Just as the existence of a computer demonstrates that there is someone who invented it, so the world in all its beautiful complexity points to the existence of a creator God. A second reason is that within the heart of man, there is a capacity to love and a desire to be loved. Christians point to that and say, it indicates that there is a power of love in the world, which many people call God. Another reason is that in every part of the world today and throughout history, men and women have always believed and worshipped God. Some people have said that in every person there is a God-shaped hole that only God can fill. The existence of that desire to pray and to believe and talk with God is one argument for God's existence. There are lots more reasons why people believe in God. Have you ever asked yourself whether God is real to you? Why did Jesus have to die? The simple answer might be that Jesus died because he was a preacher of radical ideas, who disturbed the religious and political leaders of his time, exposed their hypocrisy, aroused their jealousy, and so was condemned to death on a cross. That's not the whole story. It ignores the fact that Jesus willingly laid down his own life, that no one took it from him. He died so that we might live. He became sin so that we might be freed from sin. As the Bible says, Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. We all know that forgiveness can be costly, and it was costly for God to forgive us. It cost God his own son. We all do things that we know are wrong. Those things stop us from having a proper relationship with God. It is only as we approach God and ask for forgiveness that we can start that new relationship. Jesus' death in our place makes that relationship possible. As we begin to understand what that means, we also become aware of the love which God has for us and for all of His creation. Why should we believe in Him? First, I believe in God because I sense, at the deepest level of my being, that there is an inalienable moral structure to things. Life, love, and meaning are morally contoured. There is an inalienable law of karma that is experienced everywhere and in everything. Good behavior is its own happiness, just as bad behavior is its own sorrow. Different religions word it differently, but the concept is at the heart of all religion and is, in essence, the very definition of morality. The measure you measure out will be the measure that's measured back to you. That's Jesus' version of it and can be translated this way. The air you breathe out is the air you will re-inhale. Simply put, if we cut down too many trees, we will soon be breathing in carbon monoxide. If we breathe out love, we will meet love. If we breathe out hate and anger, we will soon enough find ourselves surrounded by hated and anger. Reality is so structured that goodness brings goodness and sin brings sin. I believe in God because blind chaos could not have designed things this way to be innately moral. Only an intelligent goodness could have built reality this way. My next reason for believing in God is the existence of soul, intelligence, love, altruism, and art. These could not have emerged simply from blind chaos, from billions and billions of cosmic bingo chips coming out of nothing, with no intelligent loving force behind them, endlessly churning through billions of years. Random chaos, empty of all intelligence and love from its origins, could not have eventually produced soul and all that's highest inside it. Intelligence, love, altruism, spirituality, and art. Can our own hearts and all that's noble and precious within them really be just the result of billions of fluke chances colliding within a brute, mindless process? I believe in God because if our hearts are real, then so is God. Next, I believe in God, because the gospel works, if we work it. What Jesus incarnated and taught ultimately resonates with what's most precious, most noble, and most meaningful inside of life and inside each of us. 
Moreover, this checks out in life. Whenever I have the faith and courage to actually live out the gospel, to roll the dice on its truth, it always proves to be true. The loaves multiply and feed the thousands and David defeats Goliath. But it doesn't work unless I risk it. The gospel works if we work it. I believe in God because the gospel works, as does prayer. I believe in God because of the existence of families of faith and the existence of church and sacrament. How about you?